Hello and welcome everybody to our Alternative Berry Production System webinar organized by UW-Madison and the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, my name is Amaya Tucha. I'm an associate professor in farmer horticulture at UW-Madison and I'm also a fruit crop specialist. And today we're really uh, excited about this webinar on honeyberry production. And we are especially excited and thankful to have uh, Jim Riddle that will be our speaker for today. Uh, Jim has been an organic farmer, gardener, inspector, educator, policy analyst, author, speaker, and avid organic eater. Jim was founding chair of the Winona Farmers Market Association and the International Organic Inspector Association and a co-author of the International Organic Inspection Manual. Jim served as the chair of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Organic Advisory Task Force and was instrumental in the passage of Minnesota's landmark organic certification cost share program, which now is a farm bill program that provides partial reimbursement for organic certification costs nationwide. Jim worked for the University of Minnesota as an organic outreach coordinator and as organic research grant coordinator for the Sears Trust. Jim co-owns and operates Blue Fruit Farm, where he and his wife grow blueberries, blackcurrants, elderberry, aronia berries, honeyberries, and more. Jim and Joyce were named the 2019 Moses Organic Farmer of the Year, and in 2013 received the Echo Farms coveted Sudis Award. In 2017, Jim received Beyond Pesticide Dragonfly Award for leading the nation in advancing organic in integrity through policy and practice. Jim served on the leadership team of the eOrganic, the National Extension Community of Practice for Organic Agriculture and was, and was the steering committee chair during the formation of the Organic Farmers Association. Jim is, a for, is a for, the former chair of the USDA National Organic Standard Board and a leading voice for organic agriculture. We are beyond excited to have you here sharing all your knowledge about honeyberries. And I'm just going to give a couple of instructions to the attendants before we give uh, the microphone to Jim. First of all, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the q and I will be monitoring them and we will be asking Jim the questions at the very end so we don't interrupt him. Uh, we will have a small little poll at the very end before we start the questions. And I will be uh, adding into the chat some uh, of the links where you can find the recording of this webinar if you want to go back to review some of the information. I would also please ask everybody to stay muted and with their videos off. Thank you, and Jim, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Amaya. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, hmm. Not finding it. I don't like this. Don't worry, we always struggle with this, even though we're all the time using Zoom. It just always seems to be something. I have my PowerPoint open on my screen, but now I've lost the Zoom screen. There, there's the Zoom screen. Uh, Yeah, please bear with me here. This is uh, well. We're still having people join it, so we can okay. a couple of minutes under the mean. Well, it says participants can now see my screen. Yeah. And if you put them in, in presenter view, that will work. Now we can. Is that it? Perfect. There you go. Okay. Honeyberries, oh my. Um, exactly. So uh, uh, thank you, Amaya, for the introduction. And thank you to the University of Wisconsin and University of Minnesota Extension for inviting me to speak today uh, on honeyberries, which is. Uh, I think a very exciting uh, fruit to now be able to grow in the uh, upper Midwest. Uh, my wife, Joyce, and I uh, own and operate Blue Fruit Farm. Um, and the land where we're located, it's about a five acre field that has been managed organically since the mid 1970s. 
Um, and uh, we farmed it in the 1980s and early 1990s doing organic uh, annual crops, vegetables and selling at the Winona Farmers Market. But we got very involved in inspecting other organic farms and then training inspectors and gave up our farming of this land, rented it out to someone else. They put up the eight foot high deer fence, rented it for a number of years. But when they pulled out in 2000, at the end of 2007, we were left with a five acre field that was protected from the deer, just growing weeds. And Joyce had the idea, let's grow blueberries. And I said, that's an easy thing to say, uh, but it's a hard thing to do because we have dolomitic soils, uh, pretty neutral pH of about 6.8 to seven. Blueberries like a pH around five or 5.5. So I knew if we were gonna be successful with blueberries, we'd have to uh, really do a lot of work to lower the pH. Um, so I said, well, we can do that. We can grow blueberries, but I'd also like to grow some uh, crops, some fruits, that um, like our soil the way it is. So we got into aronia, elderberry, black currants, and then eventually have added honeyberries to our mix. Um, and we do grow blueberries. Uh, don't those look delicious? And uh, we have about 1600 uh, blueberry plants. So it is our largest planting. Um, and uh, um, people tell us just consistently that our blueberries taste the best of any they've ever eaten. They're just packed with flavor. And they say, we even buy organic blueberries and yours tastes so much better. Why is that? Well, I hate to break it to people, but many of the organic blueberries sold now are actually grown hydroponically. They aren't grown in soil at all. So if you buy Driscoll's, for instance, organic blueberries, they're grown in pots filled with sterilized coconut fibers and just given a nutrient solution. They aren't real blueberries. So of course they aren't gonna have the flavor like our uh, field grown in healthy, vibrant soil um, uh, blueberries do. So anyway, that uh, we also grow aronia berries, otherwise known as the black choke berry. Um, we have black currants. We don't have red currants or white currants, just black currants, blueberries, a number of varieties of elderberries, the honeyberries I'll be talking about. We also have some both red and blue plum trees, and then quite a few different native prairie plants that we harvest seed. Um, so it's a very diverse uh, farm. But after doing annual crops for so many years, when we got back into uh, farming, we wanted to do perennials. Um, with the changing weather, extreme weather, doing annuals we saw as very problematic. And one of the advantages with growing perennial fruits is once you've done the original establishment, and we did several years of cover cropping to try and get weeds under control and build the soil organic matter and, and tilled under different types of cover crops. But once they're established, there's really uh, not much tillage except for weed control right around the bushes. So you really are, are eliminating both wind and water erosion. And these, are, um, these fruits are very healthy. So high antioxidants, high vitamin C, and the elderberries having antiviral properties as well. And they have just intense flavors full of uh, bioflavonoids. Um, they have a lot of market potential. Um, I like to say that blueberries are hard to grow, but they sell themselves. The other things are easier to grow, but we have to sell them uh, because a lot of people don't know what a real black currant tastes like, or they've never heard of honeyberries, and so they have no idea what they taste like. So it's a challenge. There aren't a lot of places to go for information about some of these alternative crops. I'm so glad that both these universities are really helping draw some attention because there's not been a lot of research on anything other than blueberries, especially in the upper Midwest. And it's fun, it's fun to share these flavors. We have a number of school groups come out. We have elderly uh, uh, senior university groups and, and extension agents we share. And it's just fun for, uh, uh, to share new things and learn new things. 
So some of the site selections for really all the fruit we grow, but and they apply directly to honeyberries, is you need to select a site that has direct sun, that has full sun. Some of these crops, you know, evolved in partial shade on woodland margins, but they really produce a lot better, much more vigorous um, in the in full sun. And they need good airflow. So you don't want to be in a kind of stale pocket in a valley somewhere where the humid, moist air collects. You want to have a site that has good airflow, which is really important for helping prevent uh, different fruit diseases. And then access to water, especially two times when you're establishing the young plants. If it gets dry, you need to be able to keep them irrigated. It's a significant investment and you wanna get those plants off to a really healthy, vigorous start. So anticipating having water uh, set up uh, when establishing the plants and then when they are setting fruit. And this is especially true for blueberries, uh, but we had a little issue last year where we should have watered the honeyberries. We hit a really dry spell. They, they had a good fruit set, but the, the, after the first picking, they really uh, tapered off faster than I would have liked to see uh, because we didn't put water to them, even though we did have access to water. Uh, so we learn as we go. But knowing what the proper soil pH uh, is, and we do pH testing in the spring and the fall every year, and then amend as needed with elemental sulfur for blueberries, with the honeyberries, we've really just provided high quality compost. They are much more tolerant of a wider pH range. Um, they'll, they'll do well in an acidic soil right up to neutral. So between say 5.5 and 6.8 or so, they seem to be uh, uh, do well in that kind of a range. And then you have to protect from pests. You saw in the picture, the uh, deer fence, there's also a electric fence for raccoons and then the bird netting. And I'll talk quite a bit about some of the things we do to protect the fruit from pests. Um, pollinator friendly. And that's one thing I really like about the uh, honeyberries is they start blooming around April 20th, you know, in the, towards the end of April when it's still freezing, not just frost, but freezing. And they can take a freeze. But the nice thing is, when you get those 45, 50 degree days, early spring, the overwintering um, bumblebee queens start flying around. We have a lot of native pollinators and they're looking for something to eat and they find those honeyberry flowers and they are so happy. Uh, so it provides a food source very early in the year for um, native um, pollinators. And then whether you, you know, Something else to think about is your location and whether you want to design your farm or plant these as a you pick, or if you are going to pick yourself and sell um, either fresh or frozen fruit or process them into some kind of uh, jam juice or, or finished product. But you wanna have a marketing strategy, uh, but you've got time to develop that because you aren't gonna have anything to market for a few years after you plant. So some of the challenges, I mentioned deer, various birds, especially robins and cedar waxwings uh, are, are the birds that seem to be attracted most to our fruit. Rabbits, we've had some rabbit damage to honeyberries, uh, but really only the new plantings. So now whenever we've planted new ones, we put uh, hardware cloth cages around them. You can't just wrap them like in a tree wrap because they have multiple stems. Uh, you need to have some kind of a cage, uh, but the rabbits will just come and nip the tips off of honeyberries. So you'll see kind of a diagonal cut and the tip will be laying on the ground. It's like, well, you should at least eat it if you're gonna cut it off. Um, but ra raccoons love fruit and they have a lot of friends. And you'll have one raccoon and the next night you'll have five because um, they spread the word that the fruit's in and they bring their friends. Um, so yeah, we do electric fence. 
uh, but we also do a uh, live trap and then um, send them to heaven. Uh, and uh, uh, mice um, can be a problem, once again, for those young tender plants when they're being established. Um, and I already mentioned about the need to have water for both establishment and then fruit set. And we do have a machine shed in the middle of our field and we catch the rainwater. We have about 6,000 gallons of rainwater storage. So all of our um, fruit rows have drip irrigation. And so we can um, use the rainwater until it's gone. And then when the rainwater is gone, we have a line from our well that we can uh, uh, irrigate with well water. Um, proper pruning. And I do have a slide kind of on some things to think about for honeyberries. You know, they're, they're not as intensive by any means as black currants, which black currants, we remove about two thirds of the canes from each bush every year. Whereas um, with honeyberries, it's much more just kind of a good haircut type pruning, but I'll get in, into that later. But the one thing to really think about, if you're doing this commercially or with a plan of um, commercializing the honeyberry, it's a long-term investment. You aren't gonna get any return for minimum three years, more like five years. So you do need to be able to float the operation, either with annual vegetables or with an off-farm job or whatever. But you know, go into this knowing it's gonna take time and investment and a lot of labor um, and weed control to really get those plants up so that they're producing a harvestable, marketable yield. There's a lot of hand labor involved, the planting of the stock to begin with, the preparation of the uh, planting beds, but then weeding and hand harvesting. And all of our fruit is harvested by hand. There is work going on. Uh, University of Saskatchewan are really the leading breeding site in North America um, for honeyberries. And they are uh, focusing on mechanically harvestable uh, honeyberries. Um, but so far, the varieties that have been released uh, really are best suited for hand harvest. And I'll show uh, our attempt at kind of a halfway uh, me mechanical harvest system too. Um, that didn't work out for us. So you can, you can learn from our, our, our mistakes. Um, insect pests with fruit, one of the big ones is spotted wing drosophila. But here, honeyberries are the winner of all the fruits we grow. They're the ones we don't have to worry about spotted wing drosophila because we're done, they begin, they start to ripen right around June 1st. We're done with honeyberry harvest by the end of June. And typically spotted wing drosophila does not appear until the first part or mid July uh, at our farm. So um, uh, unless the spotted wing drosophila evolves to emerge earlier, which they'd probably like the honeyberry if they could get their little uh, serrated overpositor into the honeyberry fruit. But so far uh, they haven't been a problem because the fruit are all done uh, ripening before the spotted wing drosophila appear. Um, diseases, we haven't had any disease issues at all uh, with the honeyberry. So they're a winner there. We do have some issues that we have to manage with some of our other crops, especially the uh, elderberries. But there is just a lack of knowledge and a lack of established markets um, for honeyberries. So we've done a lot of farm tours, a lot of tastings, a lot of, you know, set up a booth, even when we didn't have much to sell, just to let people taste the jam that we've made from honeyberries so that they develop uh, 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 become acclimated and desire uh, to purchase them. So think about that too as, as something you can do when you're still uh, waiting for those first crops to ripen up. So here's our field uh, from the entry gate uh, before we had put up the bird netting when we were still getting established. But you can see the machine shed in the uh, middle of the field. That's what we catch the rainwater off of. 
Um, and uh, it's, it's all solar powered. It's, there's no grid uh, run to that site. So here uh, is the, uh, a little later, you see that the black currents are bigger now. And uh, we have this overhead netting and side curtains that we've had to uh, install. And it's uh, suspended on wires nine feet above the field. And it takes a crew of four people about um, two days labor to put the netting out uh, in the, you know, when we get it out before the uh, fruit starts to ripen. And then another two days at the end of the season, because we retract it and then wrap it up and uh, uh, leave, leave it suspended, but not uh, uh, unfurled um, over winter. And we've gotten, I think it's eight years now of protection from this netting, uh, um, but it is wearing out and, and uh, occasionally you get a big windstorm post break. Um, so it's, it, it's a job, but it, it saved us thousands of dollars each year in fruit that it's uh, protected. Also, we use uh, a bird guard, uh, which we had this in place before the netting. Um, it uh, has a chip uh, right here that uh, is removable, and it has nine different sounds on any chip. And so the chip we have is for Midwest vineyard pest birds. And so robins, cedar waxwings are included. So what the chip has is calls of predators, such as the sharp-shinned hawk, and then distress calls of someone torturing robins. No, that's not how they do it, but it's an alarm cry of a robin or a waxwing. Um, and it goes off randomly. It's powered by the solar unit. It has four uh, weatherproof speakers mounted on the four corners of that building. And we turn it on whenever we're done for the day. It comes, it shuts off at night, has electric eye, comes on first thing in the morning. And then it's pretty obnoxious. So it's like the first thing we shut off when we get into the field, because we can't stand listening to it while we're working there. But it helps, it helps. Um, the other thing we've done is last year, right about this time, yeah, March 31st, um, we mounted on the top of that machine shed a uh, laser unit. And it has its own solar power. Uh, so there's a photovoltaic panel. It has its own battery bank down inside the shed. And then on top of it is this laser gun, which looks kind of like a traffic camera. It shoots a green dot that moves uh, up and down the rows and birds see that laser coming and they see it as a predator. It's not that it blinds them or kills them or harms them in any way. They see this movement coming towards them and essentially they are trained by the laser that this is an unsafe place to eat. So that's kind of the theory of how it works. This is our farm manager, Ben, and my wife, Joyce, with the guy from the bird control group, um, learning how to program it. So Ben operates it just from his smartphone and you can have it just go up and down one row. You can have it circumnavigate the entire field. So we have different programs like for the four rows that have honeyberries in them. Since they're the first fruit to form fruit and ripen, we target them and we're going to increase how we use it. We had one year of experience and I, have, I, I do want to uh, give credit to the SARE program. We got a SARE grant as well as the Lake Winds Food Co-op Farmer Field Fund because it was an investment about $12,000 for protecting our five acres. So it really wasn't in our cash flow for last year. We couldn't have done it without that grant support. I would say that it helped, but we had two rows of June berries. June berries are a very sweet, high protein fruit. They have a prominent seed and they're like a bird magnet. 
and the cedar wax wings just come for them. I've seen them dive bomb the netting trying to get into the field. And they, we were hoping that the laser would keep them out and it, it didn't. And then once they started to come, then we were worried they were gonna start getting the blueberries, which are much more of a, a, a you know, income producer for us. So now we've actually um, done two things. We have pulled up those 40 uh, uh, June berries. So we no longer have June berries. They, they just weren't worth it to us, even though they're delicious. And I encourage people to keep trying them. Saskatoons or service berries, other names for them. But in our situation, they were causing more trouble than they were worth. But also we intend to start running the uh, laser on that part of the field, the blue where 21 rows of blueberries are located uh, much earlier when the blueberries are still green and train those birds to stay out. And so hopefully we won't have to uh, cover that with the netting. But last year we ended up having to pull the netting over and really save the crop. Another innovation we've done, and, and this I'll get to honeyberries here in a moment, um, is we now have what's called a Wilsey weeder. It mounts on the back of the tractor. Someone rides on it. It has an arm with a rotating cylinder with aggressive teeth that then um, we can go down the rows and do mechanical weed control in the rows where we don't have uh, landscape fabric mulching. And uh, the blueberries have really responded uh, to this, um, to this uh, unit. Um, and then we do cover cropping after we've gotten a good weed kill and worked in the compost. Then we come back with cover crop seeds of annual ryegrass, uh, white Dutch clover, and um, uh, purple top turnips low growing, they're not gonna compete with the blueberries, but they're gonna protect the soil surface and add organic matter. Uh, so we're not just leaving it black. Anyway, uh, on to the honeyberries, otherwise known as has caps. That's primarily how they're known in Canada or blue honeysuckle. And they're called honeyberry, not because they're as sweet as honey, but because they're in the same genus as the honeysuckle. Lanacera. Uh, they are not native to North America, but they're very similar to a native called mountain fly honeysuckle that's found in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota. Um, there are quite a few different named varieties, and I'll get into what varieties we're growing, but names like Aurora and Borealis are a couple of them. Um, as I said, they ripen quite early before strawberries, so that's pretty early. Um, about two weeks before strawberries ripen. And amazing thing about them, they're good for either fresh eating or processing. So you can just eat them when fully ripe, uh, right out of hand. And they have a little zing to them. People ask me what the flavor is like, and I compare them to a slightly underripe blueberry. They have a nice rich flavor, uh, but they're also, there is some tartness to them. Um, and they make just incredible jam. They make wonderful jams or sauces and are great mixed with other fruit because they're just packed with flavor. I don't know if I mentioned, but they're known as the fruit of long life. They have the highest antioxidant levels of anything we grow. People think blueberries are high in antioxidants. Well, they pale in comparison to aronia. And aronia pales compared to honeyberry. Honeyberry has the most antioxidants of any, any of the fruits that we could choose to grow. They're very hardy to zone two. I think it said zone three, but I found out since even to zone two, they've been grown for many long time in Siberia and Hokkaido, the North Island of Japan. Um, and they do need uh, a pollinizer, a companion that uh, they aren't self-fertile. So you need uh, um, a, another type of honeyberry, a different named variety that flowers during the same window. So there are some varieties that are early, some are mid-season and some are later. 
So when you're purchasing uh, your honeyberries, make sure and get two plants at the minimum and make sure that those are compatible pollinizers to one another. And it's not like one is a sacrificial plant that only produces pollen. No, it produces fruit. Uh, but if you just have one variety, doesn't matter how many plants you have, you aren't gonna have much fruit unless you have um, a matching pollinizer. And birds do like them, but not, we haven't had anywhere near the bird pressure on our honeyberries as we do on blueberries or what we used to on June berries. Um, and I think partly, as you'll see when I show pictures, the fruit is inside the bush. It's not just sitting out there prominent like it is on those other fruits. So uh, they're a little harder to get to, I think, for birds, or they don't see them as easily when they're flying by. And as I mentioned earlier, rabbits can cause damage uh, to young plants uh, during establishment. But very flavorful, very high in antioxidants. So here's um, a young bush. This is uh, the second year after planting and they will flower in their second year and start producing a few fruits. Um, but it's really by the third year is when you'll start to get uh, some kind of a, a yield, maybe not enough to market, um, but you should start to get a significant uh, yield by year three. So here's a year, a three-year-old plant um, just starting to flower. And like I said, they'll flower you can see dandelions are blooming in the background. That's the time of year they'll be flowering when you still will get frosts. And even we've had them covered with snow when they're flowering and they don't seem to care. Um, so uh, very hardy um, and, and uh, even, even when the flowers. Uh, so there's a closer up picture. Um, you can see they are kind of, they're fairly prominent showy flowers and uh, have a lot of pollen, which I think those, um, there's one of the bumblebees working that I just love to be up in the field uh, when they're blooming, that's coming up in a few weeks and watch those overwinding queen bumblebees. They're just like dancing with the light. They're so excited to have something uh, uh, to be uh, gathering both pollen and nectar from uh, in, in large quantities at that time of year. So the varieties we grow, uh, Aurora, Borealis, Beauty, Cinderella, Tundra, Berry Blue, and Blue Bird. Now, when we first thought of getting into honeyberries, we got about, I think, four plants of each variety of Blue Bird, Berry Blue, Tundra, and Borealis and two other varieties uh, I will mention in a moment. And we just wanted to you know, see what they were like. We didn't want to put in you know, an acre or even a 400 foot row. We just wanted to check out these different varieties and see which ones perform. Tundra and Borealis are very similar to one another. Um, they're the earliest, Tundra is the earliest uh, ripening of those and it has um, kind of a, uh, a firmer fruit, um, but they're smaller. Aurora is a matching pollinizer to Borealis and Tundra, um, but it has a much longer, bigger fruit. So we've put in more Aurora. Cinderella is very similar to the Aurora and Beauty are a later variety um, that is one of those that's maybe being bred for uh, possible mechanical harvest. They're more kind of a fleshy fruit, not as juicy. Berry blue and bluebird, we didn't buy any more. We just have, I think maybe it is two of each of those. They're much more upright plants, whereas tundra, borealis, these others are round. They're like six foot tall and six foot wide when they're, when they're mature. The berry blue and bluebird have smaller elongated fruit and the bushes themselves are much taller in uh, habit. Um, and uh, weren't exactly what we were looking for, but they still um, produce good quality fruit. There are two varieties that we don't grow anymore. We had two plants each. 
of these, night mist and midnight blue. They were very vigorous. They grew really well, but the fruit was so bitter that even when we made it into jam, it was inedible. We had to throw out jam, believe it or not. We just couldn't eat it. And I don't know if you've ever tasted those red berries on a invasive honeysuckle bush, but just to try them, do that sometime. That'll give you an idea of what night mist and midnight blue taste like. They're so bitter. It's not just tart, it's bitter. Um, so we pulled those out. I had to actually use a tractor and a loader to, they developed such aggressive root systems. I couldn't just dig them up with a shovel after four years. Um, so they really liked the site, but we didn't like them. Um, so here you can see uh, some honeyberries in the middle uh, here. Uh, those are um, the uh, um, tundra and borealis. You can see they're very kind of uh, uh, round um, in shape. Uh, and uh, of course, once that snow had melted or shrunk, it would be time to prune them. So we prune in you know, late February or March, hopefully have it done and aren't still doing it in April. Uh, but important thing, and this really are kind of some generalities for all pruning, I think, is prune when the plant is dormant predominantly. I mean, you can do some when, when things are growing if you need to remove some growth, but your main pruning occurs when the plants are dormant. And I think it's really important, especially with honeyberries, is you plant them, you let them grow for a year. The next year, you really think about that plant's future. What shape do you want it to have? And you'll see some branches are crossing there and, and you've got to choose, even though they might both look really healthy, but you want to uh, uh, prevent having a lot of branches that cross and honeyberries will cross. Their branches will crisscross and you just have to make some tough choices and uh, thin them out a little bit. So you do that, if you do that when the plants are young, you save uh, pain later on. Uh, so some of ours, we did not do that and we had to um, thin them once they were bigger and then it's even harder emotionally to get yourself, to, ah, I just gotta do it um, and remove a nice healthy branch just because it's crossing and shading another one. Uh, so that's something to think about, always shaping plants so they don't have branches cross. And in general, to maximize sunlight penetration and airflow. The sunlight penetration really develops the sugars. You know, photosynthesis, you want every leaf getting hit by the sun to maximize its nutrient uptake, its photosynthesis potential and to produce sugars. Um, and then airflow, which goes hand in hand with sunlight penetration, but that's more focused on uh, preventing disease issues, just so that um, the plant can dry out after a rain or after a fog or whatever. We like to remove low hanging and lateral branches where the fruit might touch the ground, certainly get that branch out of there. Um, but we do mow, and so part of it's for not, get, you know, so the fruit doesn't hit the side of the mower. Um, but also, and this isn't so much for honeyberries, but other fruits, it's been found that the spotted wing drosophila really uh, congregate in lower bushes in the shadier, more humid part of a plant. So if you've got good airflow and you don't have those low hanging or lateral branches, uh, it can help uh, uh, prevent pest problems too. So here's some uh, uh, honeyberries. And unfortunately I don't have these marked by variety. I didn't, I didn't think ahead when I took these pictures, um, but uh, this looks like the shape of, of the uh, uh, Borealis. Um, it possibly could be tundra. But you'll see typically there will be two fruit 
at each node, the flowers, that's how they uh, grow. Sometimes they'll be single, sometimes they'll be triples, but typically there'll be two fruit and that pear typically ripens at the same time. Um, so here, a uh, nice, nice branch. You can see uh, some of these fruit are ready to harvest. Some are still a little uh, green. Um, but another point I think is really important about honeyberries. They're gonna turn blue and look like they're ripe a good week before you should harvest them. If you pick them, as soon as they turn blue, you're like, hmm, these are tart. Why do people grow these? If you leave them on the plant and let those sugars develop, wait a week, maybe 10 days, try them again, you're like, ah, these are the best thing in the world. I know why we're growing these, um, because it is dramatic, the change that happens. So don't just pick them as soon as they turn blue. Let the sugars develop. Um, so yeah, here's some more. Uh, you can see what I said about the pears. Um, and some of the, uh, the, I think this is a Cinderella, uh, have more of a bell shape to them. Um, and this would be the beauty, which is, you can see it's more compact and firm, uh, being bred for potential mechanical harvest. And these are those blue bird and berry blue bushes, much more upright uh, growth habit. And here is either a tundra or borealis. You can see it's much more spreading. And I see a couple branches that we should have pruned off that are uh, going sideways. Um, I always see that. And here's our, one of our harvest crews. It varies year to year. Um, but typically everything is hand harvested and uh, a combination of high school students, college students that live in the area and some teachers who are off in the summer looking for work uh, so that we haven't, um, I, you know, we've been able to, it's always a, a challenge to patch together a, a good harvest crew and honeyberries are one of the most tedious, probably the most tedious um, fruits to harvest because they're under the foliage. So you really have to get down, lift up each branch and uh, look for the fruit uh, under there. Whereas black currants, blueberries, they're right out there staring in the face and elderberries are up on top, you know, six foot in the air. Um, so, uh, Anyway, and so here, these are would be either Cinderella or Aurora, or much longer. Um, but you can see they do uh, bleed onto your hands a little bit. Um, and we really try to harvest the fruit and instruct all of our pickers to detach the little stem. You twist it just a little or kind of snap it as you pick it. It's gentle touch, but um, to get that stem to stay on the uh, bush and not come with the fruit. So we really try to sell clean fruit that's free of stems. So here was uh, an investment we made um, in what was called the wax wing harvester. And this device would, uh, you push it down the row, someone has to pick up those trays and then you uh, um, pull them together with a bush just standing right in the middle of the trays. And the thought and the way that University of Saskatchewan is doing it is then they would vibrate, either shake by hand or they had a machine to sh shake the bush and the fruit that's ripe would fall off in these trays. You lift the trays and dump the fruit into those totes that are sitting in back. We tried this and we got over half the fruit that fell off was green. And so we were not just creating a problem for ourselves of having to sort that out, but we were damaging our production because those weren't marketable at all. And that was fruit that would have ripened. 
we just couldn't get the system to work for us. And so we did uh, um, sell it. Um, we no longer have that unit, but maybe it works for certain varieties or certain situations, but it did not work for us. The thing we bought with it at the same time um, was a berry cleaner. So um, here it's pictured and um, uh, Katie is pouring uh, fruit. These aren't honey berries. They look like probably blueberries, maybe black currants. And uh, there's a stainless steel hardware cloth screen. You adjust the angle and then there's a very strong vacuum uh, set up. So small debris falls through into a red tray of waste. The good fruit slowly makes its way down the incline and into this tray and then leaves or any kind of light debris gets sucked off into uh, a, a collection bag. And that has been well worth it. I, I encourage someone even for honey berries, if you're doing this at a commercial level, kind of uh, this is something you should think about having. And there's just a peek at my uh, bicycle pedal powered uh, rotary elderberry destemmer too. Uh, but we aren't gonna go into that today, but uh, if you're interested in elderberries, you do need to come up with some kind of a destemmer uh, device to remove the stems. So here's a couple of honeyberries that uh, uh, still were picked probably a little ripe. That's another thing. When they're fully ripe, they separate. That lets go a whole lot easier than when they're on the green side. And you can't tell just by color. Um, and I see one or two got into this package. But we sell uh, some honeyberries um, retail in uh, half pint clamshells. But most is sold um, through our website, um, uh, people placing orders. And so uh, we're every year that we've been growing honeyberries since we've established a market, we have more demand than we can sell. And we sell our honeyberries at $10 a pound. So that, and we need to get that because of the labor that goes into the harvest. Um, it's very tedious. But here's some data. Our 2018 honeyberry yield, we got 186 pounds from 52 plants. They were about five years older. So we were getting about 3.6 pounds per plant. It'd be nice. We should be looking at six to eight pounds per plant, maybe even up to 10, but that would be a target. But still the sales uh, from those 52 plants of that amount that we harvested, each plant was bringing in $31.64. So that's not too bad. Um, um, and then uh, our yield the next year or uh, two years later in uh, 2020 was increasing because the plants were getting older, 361 pounds. So each plant was yielding $64.52 uh, worth of fruit that was sold from it. Last year, our yield was down. Um, and I'm not including, we have about a hundred more honeyberry plants that are younger, that are three and four years older. So I'm not including those here. Um, but like I said, we hit a bone dry spell um, right as they were starting to ripen. We thought the fruit set had already happened. We didn't worry about irrigating. We should have. And I think we, um, that's, that accounts for the drop in the yield. But still they were bringing in over $40 a plant. Um, so that's not bad. And then we do uh, make use of Minnesota's cottage food law for home canning of both different jams and juices. We haven't had enough honeyberries to try juicing them. I think they make incredible, powerful juice, uh, but we haven't had enough for that. Uh, but we uh, uh, make some jams um, uh, from them or mix them like with blueberries to make a honey blue, which is just out of this world good. And we sell um, uh, mostly from the farm or people placing orders on our barn to door website system. But we do a, a, a regional food event in Rochester, Minnesota called 
Feast, um, which is in uh, early December. Uh, this was before COVID, but you can see people just lined up to taste the jams and uh, uh, just um, a very fun way to expose people to the unusual fruits we grow. We also have hosted a number of different uh, farm tours, field days, um, helps other growers see what we're doing, learn from our mistakes, but also get a lot of potential buyers, people that are customers that want to come and, and experience the farm and, uh, and try the different um, fruits we grow. Uh, so I, I think that's something to think about uh, when you're doing uh, alternative fruits is uh, you've got to put time and effort into uh, educating people. So we also, I just want to mention the native prairie species that we have. They're really great for pollinators and uh, um, predators, beneficial uh, insects. The seed has high value, it's hand harvested, and then we market the seed through Prairie Moon Nursery, which is just located about a mile from our farm or less. Uh, but here's Joyce out in one of the prairie fields. So we have prairie plants in our orchard area, as well as surrounding our fruit field. So this is uh, butterfly weed in the foreground and New Jersey tea in the background. In amongst all those plum trees, we planted Hairy Mountain Mint, which is just like a bee and butterfly magnet. They love the Hairy Mountain Mint and it blooms later in the summer. So it's providing a food source to help uh, the uh, pollinators build up their food reserves. Um, this is New Jersey tea as it's getting close to harvest, those will turn black when the seed is ready to harvest. Uh, butterfly weed, is, it's in the milkweed family. So you see those pods look a lot like a common milkweed. Um, here's a butterfly on the butterfly weed and a bumblebee. Um, and then uh, a, a monarch butterfly caterpillar just beginning to form the chrysalis on uh, a leaf of one of the butterfly weeds. We also leave and sometimes even harvest the pods of common milkweed, which is another food source. Uh, the monarchs uh, only eat um, uh, the larvae, only eat um, the milkweed family. Um, so there's one of the adults even getting nectar from a milkweed flower. Also anise hyssop, bees love that one. And here is showy goldenrod just covered with the uh, native bumblebees. We're certified organic uh, by MOSA. And then we participate in the Minnesota Grown's Organic Labeling Program. We're also certified through the Real Organic Project. And that's an add-on uh, to USDA organic certification for farms that are growing in soil and for livestock producers who are actually giving their animals pasture, um, not just a window to look out of. Uh, so it's really, uh, farms that are complying with the Organic Foods Production Act, because those others are not, and it's fraudulent, but they are being allowed to be certified. But we're proud to be part of the Real Organic Project. Just a few resources I want to mention. Uh, before we got into this, a couple books that really helped, you know, general information, not a lot of details, but Uncommon Fruits for Every Garden and Grow Fruit Naturally by Lee Reich. Um, uh, uh, very understandable, well-written. Um, and you should be aware of the Organic Fruit Growers Association. There's their website. And then after that initial um, purchases of honeyberry stock, uh, one from a nursery in Oregon, and I forget the other is like Greener World or something, um, we found out about Honeyberry USA. And they're located in far northern Foley, Minnesota. And they are kind of um, a pipeline to the uh, breeding program at the University of Saskatchewan. They sell all kinds of honeyberry plants. I encourage you to look at their website. They have good descriptions of each of the varieties. They uh, say what is the compatible pollinizer or different varieties that accompany those. Um, and they sell more than just honeyberry. Uh, nursery stock. We are not a nursery, uh, but they are. So they have um, currants and uh, uh, elderberries, honeyberries, uh, those 
sour cherries, uh, lots of other things. And then just a couple of years ago, University of Minnesota released a really nice uh, book called Perennial Fruit, New, Unusual, and Unique Crops for Northern Climates. And you can download it free from the MISA website, or I think you can order a printed copy. I'm not sure if there's a charge or not, uh, but it, it's a very good resource. Um, uh, but uh, he, he underestimates the market value of honeyberries, I have to say, uh, because he estimates selling them at two to three dollars a pound and we're getting $10 a pound and selling out. Uh, so um, don't just limit yourself by what you read. And then I just wanna mention that uh, this summer, uh, we will be hosting our annual Blue Fruit Fest along with the co-op farm tour on Saturday, July 16th. It runs from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. There'll be you pick of blueberries, black currants if, if they're still in season, farm tours, a food truck, um, and you can read more about that on our website, bluefruitfarm.com. So I thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jim, for all the information that you share with us. I'm just going to put here uh, a link in the chat to where the recordings of the presentation will be posted. And I just, before we start answering some of the questions that are in the chat, I'm just going to launch a, a poll and then if people can just start answering, we, uh, I'm gonna go through some of the questions that we have here in the chat. Uh, the first one is about what are the typical BRICS, PH and TA ranges of honeyberries? Okay, um, those were too many things in one question. BRICS, so BRICS. Yes, the BRICS, um, yeah. Uh, that's a good question, and that's not something I'm really prepared to answer. I do believe that uh, on Honeyberry USA, their website for some of the varieties, it does give what the BRICS readings would be. My memory, which is always questionable, uh, tells me that around 13, 14 to 16 BRICS is what we're looking for in a fully ripe berry. But we really use our mouths mm -hmm. uh, more than just, uh, we do have a refractometer, uh, but it's tedious when we can just pop the fruit in our mouth and say, yeah, it's getting ready. Do you, there was a question about the, um, the weeder, the mounted weeder. Oh, if yes. you could repeat what's the name of, of yeah. the equipment. We'll see, uh, W-I-L-L. S I E, we'll see. It's out of Canada. They manufacture several different models, some that are where you straddle a row. And so they're more commonly used for vegetables or shorter growing plants. And then this is to the side. So it has an arm that reaches out and um, it runs off a hydraulic motor. So you have to have two-way hydraulic and then constantly have flow from your tractor to the motor. And then the driver on the back can control the speed and the kind of on off uh, of, of the uh, unit. And it lifts, you know, and you set it in place. Our tractor is only a 23 horse uh, John Deere compact utility tractor. That's minimal horsepower for it, but it will power it. But we've found that we have to have it up and start rotating the disc and then lower it before we go. If we lower it and then try to start it, that's too much stress for our small tractor. So we learned a few tricks um, to be able to use it, uh, but it's tight spaces. And um, I, it's quite adjustable as far as the amount of uh, depth, uh, and, but it, it'll tear through even quack grass. Uh, so it's pretty aggressive. There's another question about uh, nurseries to get the plants and you did mention the Honeyberry US and, and somebody actually did post uh, the link there in the chat. Do you have any other recommendations about uh, other nurseries where you can get some plants? 
Um, well, we did, um, you know, now uh, places like Fleet Farm uh, are carrying them or just your average uh, nursery where they sell apple trees, pear trees, grape vines. Now they are carrying uh, honeyberry plants. But, you know, do your research. Uh, mm -hmm. None of those kind of places are going to uh, make sure you buy a companion pollinizer, for instance. They'll sell you all one variety. Maybe that's all they got, you know. So at least go to that Honeyberry USA website and learn. It's a great place to learn, even if you don't order from them. But yeah, you can buy them retail um, at a lot of uh, nurseries these days, but it's not near the selection. And it's not some of the newer releases coming out of uh, University of Saskatchewan. We did get, yeah, Rolling River Nursery in Oregon is where we got some of that first stock. But when you can get them here in the mid, grown in the Midwest, um, you know they're gonna be much more uh, well adapted, I think, and you're supporting local businesses. Great. Uh, there's a question about if you have grown indigo jam, and if so, but, how does it compare to Borealis and Tundra? Yeah, we have not, so okay. it, it sounds good. And if I were planting more, it would be in my next order, but our farm is full. Uh, so yeah, I would give it a try. It looks good. And, any recommendations about soil texture slash drainage preference for honeyberries? Yeah, well, well-drained soil. So a, a silt loam with as much organic matter as you can get in it. You know, if you can get organic matter levels of 5%, that'd be great. Um, so if you've got a sandy soil, you've got to add a lot more organic matter to help hold moisture. The honeyberry plants, you know, they don't grow in a swamp. You know, they, they do well in a well-drained uh, type soil. They, they aren't going to, uh, you know, do well if their feet are wet all the time. Perfect. Any information that you could share about diseases? Uh, on specific varieties. Yeah, um, um, well, like I said, we haven't had a disease issue. So knock on wood there. Um, the one thing that does happen is after harvest, the plants have done, you know, they, they've done their job and they start to look kind of ragged. They will get a dusty, what looks kind of like powdery mildew, but it's not. They just look kind of dusty. They aren't vigorous. They aren't putting on a lot of new growth. Um, it really, it seems like the new growth is happening at the same time they're producing fruit um, early. And then they just kind of start going dormant, say by August, they're just kind of there. Um, and uh, we haven't, you know, I don't want to stimulate new growth. And that has been one thing with young honeyberry plants, when you get, when they lose their leaves, go dormant in the fall, you get cold weather, but then you get a late, you know, warm spell, they will start um, blossoming in the fall. Yeah. They get confused and it doesn't seem to hurt them, but we have seen um, you know, some of that happened, but it's really only the young plants. I think once they get established, then when they go dormant, they stay dormant. Perfect. And we have a ton of questions, but another question I thought is important and, and you didn't refer to this is any recommendations for uh, planting density and space between the roads uh, and, the, and in, the, in the tree road? Yeah, great question. I should have covered that. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're like I said, uh, they're around six feet wide each bush. And so you want spacing at least six feet between plants. Um, and even that, as they grow, they're going to crowd and almost become a hedge. So it all depends. Do you want to harvest a hedge or do you want to harvest individual bushes? If that's the case, you probably should be looking at eight feet between plants in row and then 10 feet between rows. So you can get in, the, in there with a mower or something. Um, we do have some that are too close. 
where we underestimated and therefore we're pruning much more upright. Um, so that we're probably not going to get as high a yield as if we would have had um, wider uh, spacing. But then we have more plants per row. Uh, so I think it evens out. I have a question about um, fertilization and if you have any recommendation for, plant, for plants that have a landscape fabric for fertilization. Yeah. You, you talked about uh, compost uh, applications. Right. And we do have uh, honeyberries on landscape fabric. And yeah, we compost and then we just hoe it in because the opening for each of the bushes is, oh, about 18 inches square. So there is quite a bit of exposed soil mm -hmm. at the base of the bush. So we just kind of work it in, but that's where, you know, we, none of our uh, honeyberries are located in the part of our field where we're using the weeder, uh, where, where it's just soil and mulch and compost and cover crops. I wish they were, because I, I think they'd perform even better that way. They have a very aggressive root system, so I wouldn't worry about causing damage to their roots with that weeder, with the uh, um, aggressive action. Um, but that sounds like a good thing for the university to take a look at. <laughs> Any, any, have you tried any um, fertilization through the irrigation system that you have? The Not with protect? honeyberries. Okay. Because they're, they look so good early in the year and we didn't even irrigate them when we should have. So I think that might be something we'll look at, but really we baby our blueberries mm -hmm. um, and maybe, and we take our honeyberries for granted probably more than we should, I think. Okay. We have one last question here is that if uh, you prune branch tip after harvest to encourage tip growth slash branching. We don't. They branch a lot. Okay. Uh, that, with honeyberries, that has not been a problem. They, they're very branchy. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think that those are all the questions that we have. We are about eight minutes past the hour. I Jim, I really want to thank you for sharing all your knowledge about uh, honeyberries. I think we're all excited. As I told you, I bought a couple of bushes for my house, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, yeah. I know that they're delicious and that they are a good alternative for really early fruit production uh, here in the region. Yeah, and I'm so going to. I just again encourage the, the people post. to try them. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Try eating them and try growing them. Good. So the, the, again, the link for the, where we're gonna post the recording, if you wanna go back, is there in the chat. And thank you so much, Jim, for sharing all this information with us and everybody that attended today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.